uh, we are joining here with a series of webinar, inshallah, uh, uh, that will be once a month. And today we are starting it with dyslipidemia. And I'm uh, lucky to have with me uh, uh, my colleagues, my friends uh, uh, who are participating as a speaker. So let me introduce them first. Uh, we have Dr. Kamran Babar with us. He's an international cardiologist from Multan. Then we have Dr. Asad Akbar Khan. He's also an international cardiologist from Shifa International Hospital, Sambad. We also have Dr. Tayyab Moyuddin, who's an international cardiologist at National Hospital, DHA, Lahore. And I'm really thankful to all of them because they have made a lot of homework for this particular activity. Usually it doesn't happen. We just come up with our slide and present and then go away. But this webinar was really thought out very carefully to take care of your needs in terms of practical issues. So that's why we are starting with, with this uh, uh, three scenarios, which I'm displaying in front of you. Just few seconds, look onto these scenarios, try to make out how will you treat or take care of them that's the first 45 years male with no known comorbids, did his lipid profile by himself and present blood pressure, total cholesterol levels, TGs. We'll discuss all of them at the end of the discussion when all of our speakers will go through their uh, slides, their uh, talks, and we'll come up to discuss how to address these patients in terms of managing their dyslipidemia, whether statin, non-statin, or whatever. That's the first scenario. Then we have the second one, a 60 years, smoker, diabetic, hypertensive male, his present blood pressure is 150, 90, lipid profile showed cholesterol 215, LDL 135, TGs 275, and HDL 42. And this is the third one. 44 years, diabetic male, extensive and cheerful. MI, two months back, his present blood pressure 130, 80, and uh, his total cholesterol values are there. I'm just displaying these three ones to have your insight into them. And now I'm just going to our first talk. And for that, I'll be uh, requesting Dr. Kamran Babar because that's the first step in management of this lipidemia. It's not the cholesterol level. It's not the lipid profile. You have to stratify risk of your patient first and then decide which of your patient needs and whichever not, need, uh, not needing it. I think Kamran Babar is ready with his slides. Uh, so just Kamran, you can share it and start your proceedings. The first talk, Dr. Kamran Babar, how to stratify risk. All right, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Good afternoon, everyone, Juma Mubarak. So my part of the presentation is gonna be the risk stratification for a patient that's gonna require treatment. And when you say treatment, we're gonna go into a little more detail based on um, what is the risk level of this patient. It all comes down to the same level of commitment that you do when you're seeing a patient that mentally you are thinking whether this patient uh, lies in a low risk category, a medium risk category or high risk category. And that's how you kind of like decide that, okay, this is the intervention that I need to. But our mind when we are seeing these patients in our clinical practice is on one hand to use those tools which are objective, which are time tested, which are tested on hundred thousands of patients. And you can implement the same tools to assess the risk of your patients. So one of the most common risk calculator that we use um, is ASCVD risk calculator. So it's a very simple tool that you can actually have it in your cell phone or your desktop. And sooner or later, your mind automatically uh, starts giving you an idea that where does this patient lie in terms of risk stratification? Um, look at, looking at the age, this calculator was made actually uh, looking at patients from 40 plus, but the part two, ASCVD2 actually incorporates now age starting 20 till age 79. Then sex, race, systolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, whether they are diabetic, smoker, hypertensive, 
they are taking medication for um, dyslipidemia or they are taking chronically aspirin and you plug in these numbers and this actually gives you an objective assessment of their risk, not only for next um, at the time of their evaluation, but 10 years down the road, that how likely they are to end up with a cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack, CBA, stroke, MI, or something requiring uh, an intervention. So when you're using this um, calculator, uh, you stratify if they're a low risk category, uh, you want to start their treatment, which does not mean medications, but lifestyle modification. In reality, that's easier said than done. And I think over the treatment, we're gonna be talking a little more in detail. Then there is a borderline risk, which is five to 7.5%, intermediate risk, 7.5 to 20%, and high risk, which are more than 20%. So while you are evaluating based on this risk, there are certain other things clinically, as uh, Professor Fawad pointed out, that you really need to focus on and that does not just mean numbers, because a lot of our colleagues, they do their fasting lipid profile and they come to you and say, okay, my friend, can you look at it and tell me what should I do about it? It requires a discussion. It requires evaluation. And that's how you are able to risk stratify whether this patient is going to require medications or just lifestyle or what level of medication and what should be your goals. And that's going to be discussed by other speakers in this talk. If the uncertainty is there, like with all the discussion and all the numbers that you have in front of you, you still are not sure how aggressively you want this person to be um, tackled, then you can use some other modalities as calcium scoring. And that can help you decide whether lifestyle alone or you need to add medication to the lifestyle. So what are the risk enhancing factors which should be sorted out during this discussion with the patient? So family history, of course, uh, which according to international criteria, less than 55 in males and in females 65. But what we are seeing in our Southeast Asian ancestry, especially the subcontinent area, that we fall prey to cardiovascular disease 10 years earlier than this age. Um, primary hypercholesterolemia, if somebody without any symptoms have an LDL more than 190, of course, those patients are very high risk and they should be started on medications to reduce the risk for any future event. Metabolic syndrome is actually really important for our own group of patients over here because we all love to eat fried carbs as our dietary choices, sweets. So triglycerides becoming high is something which we see very common in our population when they do get uh, their fasting lipid profile checked. Elevated blood pressure, elevated glucose, HDL, um, kidney disease is also something, especially the albuminuria, and you really need to calculate eGFR on these patients in order to evaluate. More so from non-cardiac point of view, chronic inflammatory conditions, they also pose a vital risk for a patient for their plaque to rupture and suddenly falling prey to an ACS or a stroke. Other things is premature menopause that we see in a lot of our ladies, history of pregnancy associated preeclampsia or eclampsia. A lot of studies, data has really shown us that these patients really fall prey to early hypertension, early uh, metabolic syndrome, leading to uh, ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease. When you used to work in uh, um, uh, New York, whenever there used to be a Southeast Asian coming in the emergency room, our emergency consultants used to make us see that patient on priority because, you know, these guys, they really like to come very late to our attention. So you should pay attention to these guys when they come to emergency room. So looking at uh, lipids and biomarkers, traditionally in Pakistan, we are using just the journal four or five markers that we see and we calculate a lot of non-HDL and other markers that we do based on calculations. But uh, guidelines are recognizing other risk factors as well, FOB levels, LPA, and you have to keep an eye on these so that you can risk stratify. Um, but unfortunately, since our labs are not equipped enough to give this as a routine matter, so many a times patients don't afford to pay this much money for, for these tests. But relatively, what they're doing is that they are correlating that normally if you see an elevated LPA level more than 50, uh, that almost looks, corresponds to what level of LDL in your test. Similarly, if elevated FOB level 
is elevated more than 130, that corresponds to something along the lines that your triglycerides are more than 200. And having a peripheral arterial disease, we don't generally check ABIs, but centers which are equipped to do peripheral interventions, they routinely do ABIs, but this is something which is a skill to be learned. And even in America, a lot of practices um, have to hammer down to their uh, nurse practitioners to get the socks off, get this test done so that you can evaluate these patients from that point of view. So who are the high-risk patients? High-risk patients are age more than 65 who have familial dyslipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, high triglycerides, prior coronary bypass or any intervention done. Diabetics are considered as high risk as if they have really high um, risk as if they have had an MI done. And they have in studies which have actually nailed it down that their risk for 20 year mortality is same as patients who have a MI in reality. Hypertensive patients, CKD, uh, current smokers, really high persistent elevated LDL. And if somebody has congestive heart failure, especially if it is associated with obesity, they, they are with obesity and uh, heart failure becomes a major risk factor. Very high risk patients are the patients who have recent ACS and within the past 12 months. For those, you have to go really high on medications and that's gonna be um, um, discussed in detail by my colleagues. History of MI other than ACS, non stemi or so, which can happen or sometimes demand and mismatch supply um, leading to um, uh, an ACS and MI, which requires um, very high dose uh, statin or really aggressive treatment for these patients. History of stroke along with, if any, peripheral arterial disease, especially if it is symptomatic, then these patients uh, require very close attention. The diabetic patients many a time don't have symptoms. So based on that, the guidelines actually narrowed down that if they are asymptomatic, but their diabetes is more than 10 years, then consider them as if they are high-risk patients. If they have albuminuria, more than 30 microgram per, and if they have retinopathy, neuropathy, or ABI less than 0.9, these patients really need you to cater them with care and more aggressive treatment. Calcium scoring is on one hand used to confirm, but many a times it is used to exclude. So if your patients have some uh, understanding in terms of that they're really questioning the need for statin, you do this, and if the calcium score is zero, then you can be a little more comfortable telling them that, okay, you know what, um, at this point, I don't see the need that you need to be on statin therapy. If somebody has any side effects of statin, myopathy, high LFTs, you switch a couple of salts and still they are having trouble. Now you're really questioning that whether you need to try another salt and before that you want to risk stratify. Calcium scoring by CT helps you decide whether how pushy you need to be for these patients. Older patients, um, especially in more than 70 years of age, 70 to 79 age is something that you want a little more comfort in terms of just uh, using a calculator, you want imaging. So calcium scoring at that time can give you an idea of whether you really need to give them patient. And after 80, since the benefit is questionable, so it really comes down to your own clinical sense, whether you want to put these patients um, on statin therapy. This last slide, it looks busy, but in reality, this is just a um, recap of what we have discussed. So when you are assessing a patient clinically, what you can actually um, do is check their fasting lipid profile. If it is an asymptomatic person and LDL is more than 190, um, this patient definitely requires um, to be on statin because that's gonna reduce the risk of any future event um, more than 30 to uh, 48, 49%. If they have premature family history of ASCVD, if somebody has CKD, metabolic syndrome, um, ladies with preeclampsia or premature menopause, any inflammatory disease and our ancestry automatically puts you at high risk category uh, situation. CRP is checked uh, many a times, LPA levels, FOB and ABIs, and these are adjunct tests that you can do in selected patients that you need to uh, risk stratify. Um, once you do an ASCVD risk calculator and the age category is uh, more than 20 up till 79, um, if they have diabetes, of course, they're going to be borderline to high risk, and you can risk stratify further with calcium scoring if you need to do uh, the risk stratification. So with that, um, I would stop, and uh, I think we can move on to our uh, next part of the presentation. 
thank you, Babur, for very nicely covering in a very brief time. That's, and I think our scenarios were incomplete in that sense. We haven't had that information to decide about them. Although we discussed at the end regarding how to choose, but now we are switching from risk assessment to statin therapy. And uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Asad Akbar Khan now. I think you can stop your uh, slide yeah. sharing, uh, Kamran, and then he will be able to share his slides. And then sure. we'll move on to that, uh, our next talk. This is also, again, a very important subject. It's not just statin, what dosages, how to start, how to really monitor. So I think it's up to uh, Dr. Asad Akbar Khan. Um, yes. Um, so good afternoon everyone um, and i think um, it's a hard act to follow after such a nice talk and so there will obviously be a bit of repetition uh, in terms of uh, uh, the slides that we are going to use uh, that i'm going to use uh, with uh, kaman because obviously our uh, topics overlap a bit so i'm going to talk about briefly who uh, are the people who should be treated with statins and we have all i think and i hope uh, have a good idea of uh, how do we calculate these risks uh, of various uh, types of patients who come to us? So once we have calculated these risks, uh, that is when we discuss uh, the statin therapy. So most of my talk uh, and my slides will be from the 2019 ACC guidelines. Uh, so one of the uh, 10 recommendations that they have given uh, for primary prevention uh, is that, as Kamran mentioned as well, that we should all consume a healthy diet, which uh, consists of vegetables, fruits, nuts, trans fats, uh, less trans fats and red meat and less carbs. So people, uh, what they have recommended is that people who are 40 to 75 years of age and are being evaluated for SCVD, uh, there should always be a clinician and patient risk discussion before uh, starting any pharmacological therapy, be it aspirin, satin or antihypertensive therapy. So starting, uh, I'm gonna keep it very brief. So patients, who are low risk, obviously we are gonna determine various other risk factors and majority of your statin therapy starts from essentially intermediate risk and above. So patients with intermediate ASCVD risk, uh, it's, the, uh, it's a uh, one day indication to start them on a moderate intensity statin once you've discussed the risks and benefits with them. And again, the patients who are uh, intermediate risk and you've discussed with them the possible benefits. And once you start them on lipid lowering therapy in, term, in form of statin uh, patients, uh, you should be aiming for a 30% reduction in their LDLC. And patients who are considered high risk, uh, you should be aiming for 50% uh, or more reduction in their LDL levels. In diabetics, it's very simple. Adults 40 and above, if they have diabetes, regardless, regardless of their estimated score, you start them on a moderate intensity statin. And in patients who are 20 to 75 years of age uh, with a very high LDL, you need to start them on a maximally tolerated statin as soon as possible. Patients who have diabetes and other uh, risk factors as well, it then in these patients, you go for a high intensity statin rather than a moderate intensity statin that you went for in a simple diabetic. And the aim is to reduce the LDL levels by 50% or more. Patients who have a borderline risk or a lowish risk, uh, once you have a risk discussion with them, you need to assess for risk enhancing factors, which Kamran has mentioned. And one of the things uh, that I particularly look for, because uh, uh, Pakistan is facing a pandemic of diabetic patients. And uh, one of the recent World Health Organizing, uh, Organization data uh, showed that we are number third in the world in terms of the proportion of diabetics that we have. So I, I really look for these enhancers like long duration of diabetes, albuminuria, EGFR, end organ damage in terms of retinopathy, neuropathy. And if these are present, uh, I think there is no um, uh, doubt in my mind after that, that we are going to discuss uh, and uh, make sure that the patient stays on a high dose statin. So again, Kamran mentioned this calcium scoring and uh, a lot of our patients are very resistant to statin therapy because I feel, and as Kamran mentioned as well, that in our population, the risk is not at 55, but rather at 45. But also, I think in our population, the side effects of these medicines start at a much lower dose than uh, what's described in, in the textbooks. That's why the patients are very reluctant to start these statins. And one 
of the things that you can do is a calcium score, uh, which Kamran has also mentioned. Uh, so that can help convince them that there is enough data to suggest that these patients will benefit from statin therapy. Older patients with low burden of risk factors are always the ones questioning uh, the side effects on the INA and things like that. And in them, you have to come up with certain evidence to make sure that if you're giving them statin therapy, you have enough to back it up. And then patients who are restarting statin therapy because they stopped it for some other reason also need a lot of convincing. So what do you do with a calcium score? So once you have done the calcium score, if somebody who, had, who is at intermediate risk and their calcium score is zero and they don't want to start statin therapy, then maybe it is okay to uh, leave them off and reassess in five to 10 years. If their calcium score is one between one and 99 and they are 55 years or more years of age, and probably I agree with Kamran for Pakistani population, probably 45 and above, uh, you should uh, consider starting statin therapy. If the calcium score is more than 100, then definitely uh, you start statin therapy. So there are some scenarios which are given by ESC 21 guidelines. Uh, again, they also recommend a shared decision making process. Uh, same slide, I, I won't go over this because Kamran has already gone over it. So what do we get with uh, statin therapy? What we know that for every one millimole reduction in LDL, you are significantly reducing the risk of morbidity and mortality. How much do you get out of these medicines that you prescribe? And I think uh, obviously we don't have data for, uh, it's not all statins are the same, uh, but probably for the ones, uh, atorvastatin and uh, rosuvastatin, these uh, general rules of thumb uh, hold true. For a, If you start somebody on a moderate intensity statin, you're looking at a, approximately a 30% reduction. High intensity statin, about a 50% reduction in the LDL. And then high intensity statin plus azitimibe, you're looking at about 65% reduction. Again, a few scenarios uh, quickly from ESC guidelines. In patients who are less than 70 years of age and are considered high or very high risk. If they are very high risk, you're looking at a 50% reduction from baseline. If they are high risk, you are looking at 50% reduction at baseline from baseline or an LDL of around 70 milligram per deciliter. In patients who have established uh, cardiovascular disease, you are aiming for an LDL of 55 or somewhere close to that. And if the goals are not achieved in maximum tolerated dose of statin, you start you uh, you should start a combination therapy with azitimide. Um, uh, again, triglycerides. Uh, we had a discussion over them. We will go through that in the end as well. But in patients who have a triglyceride level more than uh, 200, uh, as Kamran mentioned as well, that these uh, it's not just hypertriglyceridemia. This might be a hint that these patients have. Uh, increased lipoprotein A or EPO-A as well. So you need to start them on a statin therapy, not a fibrate, but at least a statin therapy. So in patients who are older, greater than 70 years of age, uh, initiation of, 70, uh, of statin therapy for primary prevention may be considered only if they are at high risk or above. Uh, statin should always be started in a low dose, not the usual high doses that we start our younger patients on. And then uh, patients with diabetes, who are considered high risk, you start and aim for an uh, LDL reduction of 50% or more. In patients who are already at high risk, uh, you start with an LDL reduction aim of uh, around, uh, aiming for an LDL of around 70. And if they have target organ damage, then uh, uh, you need to aim for something less than 100 at least. Uh, so dialysis patients, quickly, um, you can always start patients who are on dialysis on statins and azitimibe if their risk factors allow. If they are dialysis dependent and they, have, uh, they don't have any definite evidence of cardiovascular disease, then commencing statin therapy is not recommended. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Asad, again, for covering a very vast subject in just a few minutes. And I think now you can stop your slide sharing. We'll move on to uh, Dr. Tayyab Muhyuddin, and uh, as, as we are progressing, our participants are constantly increasing. Now we are reach up to 100, and I, I uh, say to all audience that main interesting part is after the talk. That's the discussion on that scenario. So just keep intact. 
And I think Tayyip is ready with his slides. So now over to Dr. Tayyip Moyuddin for non-statin therapy. Yes, Dr. Tayyip. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Fawad and uh, my other two colleagues who have uh, raised the bar too high by their <laughs> wonderful presentation. So uh, I'll try to contribute as much as possible uh, to non-statin therapy. So uh, I'm just gonna rehash with these few lines what Kamran and Asad has mentioned that LDLC is a modifiable risk factor and statins are the gold standard. And uh, still we see patients who are unable to achieve these goals. And then there are non-statin drugs who have demonstrated cardiovascular benefits. So the ACCAHA and the FDA has approved certain non-statin medical therapy and they've been in limelight since some of them have approved the FDA in just past few months. So and these are for these following high-risk patients. Now, my colleagues have described the high-risk patients already. So uh, individuals who have less than anticipated response to statins, individuals who are unable to tolerate a less than recommended intensity of uh, statin, individuals who are completely statin intolerant, so uh, these are some agents that we have used as ATMD PCSK9 inhibitors, PCSK9 inhibitors plus high intensity statin and PCSK9 inhibitors plus high intensity statin plus ATMD. And you can see the average LDLC reduction. I so just showed this slide which showed high intensity statin plus ATMD decreases it by 65%, which is ex excellent because our goal is 50%. Now PCSK9 inhibitor by themselves would do 60% and with statin, they go up to 75%. If we all these, all, uh, add these three agents, which is a high intensity statin plus uh, Azita MEV and PCSK9, you can go up to 85%. That is like you're almost eliminating the LDLC out of your body, which is wonderful. Uh, some slides this is from ESC 2021 guidelines, um, though I'm also American trained like the rest of my colleagues, but uh, I use the ESC guidelines as compared to ACC ones, and they're kind of very similar, other than the calcium scoring that they have alluded very nicely to. So the, and the, 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 it's very simple, you know, the recommendation is if the goals are not achieved with maximum dose of tolerated, the maximum tolerated, tolerated dose of statin. So it's very important that it's a tolerated dose of statin combination with the ZMEB is recommended. Now, if you have a patient with primary prevention who's very high risk, then if they cannot tolerate, you can uh, consider putting them on a ZMEB or consider PCSK9 inhibitors. For secondary prevention, things are different. Again, if you are not able to achieve the goals, then definitely you should consider zeta B or even consider PCSK9 inhibitors. Same thing for patients who have family history of hypercholesterolemia that is considered high risk as uh, Kamran showed in one of his slides and they are not able to achieve goals, then you can consider adding a PCSK9 inhibitor or a zeta B. And same thing if they are not able to tolerate the uh, uh, statin therapy due to the side effects. Same thing again, they are showing in a different way. One thing is if the statin is not recommended in a premenopausal female who are considering pregnancy and are not on adequate contraception, then you should avoid statins in this case. This slide again uh, was shown by Asad just a few minutes ago that shows that the patients uh, who have high triglycerides who are actually, he showed a different slide that who have a triglycerides greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter and at high risk, they should be considered starting on statin. But the patient is already on statin and they still have a triglyceride higher than 200 milligram per deciliter, then you should consider to be on phenofibrinate at that point in time. It's a class 2B indication over here. Now they have mentioned after phenofibrate that you, we can use PUFA, which are polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are omega fatty acids that a lot of our patients come and ask us questions about that they get uh, over the counter medication. It's a very nice uh, flow sheet that we can look at it, which tells us about the mechanism of action, dosage and frequency, route of administration, how these agents uh, kind of work. And this is most of them that are present available in the Western hemisphere also. Very few of them are available here in Pakistan with us. So starting with azitimib, which is very commonly available in Pakistan, it came in different drug names and now we are getting uh, statin with this azitimib combination pills coming up recently. So uh, they inhibit the sterile transpo uh, transporter and this is present in small intestine, this is present in your brain. And uh, this uh, has a dose of 10 milligrams per day uh, 10 milligrams per day, and the route of administration is oral. The LDL loading is less than 18%. The side effects are diarrhea, arthralgias, upper respiratory tract, 
symptoms. Now, the other things are, which we know about RPCSK9 inhibitors. And I wrote down on the paper, so I said for the one time in my life, I would say how they, what is this abbreviation for? So this is pro-protein convertase subtilin kexin type 9 enzyme that you inhibit. Again, present in intestines and CNS. And the two, three agents that are currently available are alirucimab, evolucimab, and infilicerin that's present. So alirucimab, uh, it comes by the name of Praluent. Uh, costs about $6,000 a year right now, the current price in the Western Hemisphere. It's about $500 a month. So it is given every two weeks or every four, four weeks. That's the beauty of it. And you give it subcutaneously. It decreases the LDL by 50%. Does give side effects or injection, and it can cause nasopharyngitis or flu-like symptoms. Evolucimab, uh, which goes by the name of Rapata. Uh, again, it's every two weeks or every four weeks, subcutaneous, and it decreases the LDL level by less than 50%. Now we do have this bempodoic acid, uh, which is now FDA approved. It was FDA approved just two years ago, came by the name of Nexilitol. I never prescribed while I was working in America or some of my colleagues would be available, uh, maybe familiar with it. Inhibits ATP separate lyase. Those is 180 milligrams daily. A gout and thrombocytopenia and leukopenia is the main issue with it. It does increase the uric acid and causes some muscle spasm uh, issues. And inclycerin, again, is a kind of inhibits the production of PCSK9. It does not inhibit the PCSK9, but inhibits the production of PCSK9. Uh, the beauty of uh, this is it's only given twice yearly. And again, you could see results up to 30 to 46%. FDA has recently approved them in the past six months to a year. Previously, we had clinical trials going on. So I'm pretty sure a few of my patients who get it from Dubai, and now I've heard that another pharmaceutical company is launching it here, they're bringing it. So it's very exciting times uh, uh, for that. So um, there is another agent that we, it's not part of my slide that I would like to talk, are bile acid sequestrants. It's they come in the name of Sam, Valcol, that I have prescribed in America. Again, not available in Pakistan, and that is again one of the agents that could be used. So with this, we'll stop and we'll go to the questions. Thank you. Okay, now it's time to move on to translating guideline into practice. So we'll come to scenarios again and take the uh, uh, input of our worthy speakers how to solve this problem in a way that... Uh, mm, so the first, I think, we'll, we'll be starting with the first scenario, 45-year male and... Uh, no, no comorbids, lipid profile by himself, his present blood pressure. So I think I'll go first to Babar. Kamran, how should we approach this patient? I think, yeah. All right, yes. All right, so basically 45-year-old guy. Um, I mean, one of our age mates almost. So coming in with no real problems, who gets his lipid profile done, totally asymptomatic. And uh, blood pressure is 135, 75, total cholesterol 215, LDL is 135, triglycerides are 275. And this HDL is actually higher than what we usually see in our patients in 42. So if you see this patient, I would, apply ASCVD calculator on this guy. So let me plug in um, these numbers and let me do a slide. Would you share. like to share your slide? Yes, please. Okay. All right, can you see this Excel sheet? Yeah. So, what I've done is, in the interest of time, I have plugged in all the numbers in here already. 45-year-old male, um, he is having a total cholesterol of 214, HDL 42, systolic blood pressure 135. He is not smoker, not diabetic, and uh, does not take any medication for blood pressure. So when you plug these numbers, what are you getting is a 10-year ASCVD risk of about 3.1%. Oh. So, if you do a perfect individual who has even better results than this at this age, at the ideal should be 1.2, which is in the green here we can see. The lifetime ASCVD risk is still 
So if you look at the average age of any person that we have is about mid 60s to 70. So there is a very high um, chance that he might fall prey to episodic heart disease if we leave everything like this. So a person who has a 10-year ASCVD that is less than 5% is where we start the treatment with a non-medical uh, way in which we're going to ask him, check his height, weight, calculate his BMI, uh, promote him to um, walk at least 10,000 steps. These days, are smart watches are very common and they're not very expensive. So you can get it really good with uh, synchronized on your cell phone, count your 10,000 steps a day. Um, burn calories, do sports, do cardio, increase your heart rate. You can do all these things to motivate yourself and, and, and kind of like keep track on um, how your performance gets better as you put a little more step-by-step, -step, uh, little jogging, little running, uh, going to the gym, uh, playing strenuous exercise, squash, cycling, tennis. So these are the kind of things that you need to incorporate at age 40, 45. The important thing is that what if your patient says, you know what, I don't really want to feel like doing any of these things and why don't you just give me medicines? That is never should be our approach to such a patient to promote that. We want them to, even if you are going to take medicines, you have to incorporate lifestyle modification. You have to understand that having your LDL high and reducing it with medication is not a substitute to lifestyle modifications. Style change. So, okay. so that is what apparently, I would recommend. Yeah. yeah, Kamran, apparently it looks, it's not the cholesterol number. You have very clearly shown, and very, we have seen very commonly people just treating cholesterol level without seeing the patient status. And let's take an insight of Dr. Asad into it as well, that such kind of scenario, what happens to the risk or what additional thing could have happened we have to switch to statin. Asad, can you just postulate something in this particular scenario? Yeah. That, that would uh, have been... I think, I think a very, very uh, well-described case by Kamran. And I think what you just mentioned is a very common scenario in Pakistan. You, What I'm going to elaborate on it a bit more, and I'm sure all of us can relate to it. All you do is you get this cholesterol report in your on your WhatsApp. And underneath, somebody writes, who, mm -hmm. who's... Uh, and the report doesn't even bring, uh, uh, it does not even, it's not even his report. Like it's his yeah. friend's report who he has forwarded to you and you, he wants a treatment just based on that report. That report. And if you are, yeah. And if you are not tired, you'll probably call them <laughs> and you'll ask them for a history. If you are really tired, you would want to see the patient, which is the right way of doing it. Just like we have just discussed that it's not the cholesterol number. You want to see the patient. If a guy is a 20 year old guy who just needs some lifestyle optimization, you don't need to start some therapy to them. And then if a guy is 60 year old and has all the risk factors in the world and who is reluctant to start statin therapy, you might want to have a discussion with them, uh, discuss how statin therapy can improve things for them and what sort of a risk uh, they entail to themselves if they don't start on something uh, soon to reduce that cholesterol. So again, it's not just the cholesterol number. It's about the whole patient. You need to take a good history, a very brief history. We know just like Kamran did it so quickly. And I'm going to show, uh, hopefully, if uh, I get a scenario too, that it, that ASCVD risk factor is very quick to uh, interpolate data on. And like it takes barely two minutes. And you can show it to them if they are literate enough that if that's how uh, that's the amount of risk they are looking at. So I again, uh, I think very re relevant to our clinical uh, uh, situation in our, uh, in our OPDs, in our personal lives. Let's take Dr. Tayeb input as well. There is something wrong with triglyceride as well here, 275. But overall patient risk is very low. So how you advocate regarding fibrates and that's very commonly seen that people start fibrate on high triglyceride level, even with statin? So yes, some... uh, yes, so this is a very commonly seen scenario, uh, very typical of this patient, actually. Uh, uh, this kind of scenario kind of pertains a little bit more towards the part of the talk that I gave that you would get these uh, lipid profiles on your WhatsApp, as Asad said, and the triglycerides, they would say TGs are high. 
So we have to go with the data and my colleagues have shown the data and uh, Kamran did beautiful Excel sheet, you know, and it showed that the 10 year risk score is low at this point in time. Uh, now what to do with this TG? So as the guidelines say, it's 500 milligram per deciliter. Now, if you have a high risk patient, uh, then it's a different story, which he's not a high risk patient. As we know, yeah. the 10 year score is 3.5. So if you have a high risk patient, then it's a different story. If a patient has an established health, or whatever, all the criteria of the high risk patient, then in that case, you will need to treat these TGs, but that again with a statin, not with a fibrate. You have to treat that. And that Asad showed in his talk uh, very nicely that then in that case, you need a statin at that point. You're not going to jump to fibrate right away. So take home message is if somebody whose TGs are less than 500 and it's not a high risk patient, uh, lifestyle modification is the way to go. Treating your metabolic syndrome, um, as Kamran just mentioned, all the good things to do, uh, just uh, follow those and that would help with the TGs. Now, if you have a familiar hypertriglyceridemia or your TGs are more than 500, if, if it's not familial, then you need a pharmacotherapy. So it's a very conclusive comment. 500 and above, we need treatment, especially in moderate or low risk. High risk, again, we are treating this mild derangement of triglyceride, not for sake of taking care of triglyceride. It's an indicator of high EPO lipoprotein B, which is another risk. So that's why we are treating it with statin rather than fibrates. Yes, beyond certain limit, both LDL, triglyceride, high risk, then two B indications for giving both of drugs together. You rarely found such patients in which you have to give statin plus fibrates, which we are seeing very commonly in general practitioner levels, mild derangement of LDL and mild derangement of TGs and both on uh, fibrates and statin. Let's come to, I think, second scenario. Uh, uh, that is, and I would uh, say Asad to start with this, to comment on what to do. I think third one would be for us, uh, Tayyab, you can start with it. Sure, I was looking at the third one, but I can start. <laughs> <laughs> Ajay, can I just I say mean. that I have prepped this second one on the ASCVD. All right, list. all yours, yeah. brother. Okay, okay. I'm stopping. I think we've got Trump each other here. And like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> stick to the plan. Okay, okay uh, I'm okay. stopped sharing it. You can continue <laughs> yeah. with your slide. So, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, so give me one second. Um, um, oh, um, one second. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There. Acha. So I'm just gonna quickly show everyone uh, what. Uh, do they need to do? So this is the ASCVD risk estimator. Easily available, you just Google it. This is what pops up. All you have to do is demographics, right? So you click male, the age of this age. patient is now 60. So for race, we are going to click other because we are talking about our own population, not whites or African-Americans. Uh, pretty simple. So labs, they, all they want is the total cholesterol, the HDL, the systolic BP, Diabetic status, high, uh, smoker, and treatment for hypertension. It's not mentioned in the scenario, but we'll consider it as yes. Uh, we can do both. So if you click these, this is this barely takes like a minute. And what you have is a 10-year estimated risk of around 41%. So this is an extremely high risk patient. And so they, uh, this data you get out within a couple of minutes, and you know straight away that these patients need intensive statin therapy. So there is no questioning in my mind that I'm going to spend even if I have to, I'll spend at least half an hour on this one. If I need convincing, I'll talk to their family as well. They need to be started on statin therapy. If they have already been on it or they're intolerant of it, they are afraid of the side effects. Uh, I personally have even gone to something as low as 5 milligram of statin or 10 milligram of statin, like twice a week even or even once a week. You start them slowly on it once they see the benefits, you slowly go up on it and uh, you will definitely be doing a lot of good to this particular patient if you start them on certain therapy, uh, in my opinion. Let's see that how the risk calculator has changed management decision altogether. In the previous patient, same cholesterol levels, same HDL, same LDL, 
but without drug, just conservative measures. And in this patient, we have so much high risk that even if you're not getting target, so we can move on to and how to offer non-statin in this patient when and where. So, Aapko thoda sa hissa de dete so non-statin therapy in this case uh, would be if you don't achieve the goals, which again would be greater than 50% of LDL reduction, then in that case, yes, definitely. Or the patient is very intolerant. Uh, even in that case, the recommendation would be that you need to give a retrial of statin. You need to try a different statin. And we haven't talked about that. I think that's just another separate topic. But that should be your main goal of treatment, that you need to give patient a trial of statin therapy, maximal tolerated dose. Now, if the patient cannot tolerate it or you're still not able to achieve the goal, that you're not able to achieve less than 50% reduction or the LDL is not less than 50 if you have, uh, milligrams per deciliter, then you will add another agent. And as for now, the where we are living right now in Pakistan, as it to me, we would be the next step to add to. Okay. So if, if you're not getting target, but in some patients where you have LDL very high, can we start it right from the beginning of combination one? Well, guidelines haven't said that yet, but I right. think that would be reasonable anecdotally. I, I would still say stay with the statin first, uh, go to the maximal. What we have seen these days is there are combination pills that has been present for some time, especially with the Dorva statin. And I've seen a lot of 10-10 prescriptions. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. That's a very I, nice point you have raised. A low dose of statin with a combination. This is really not on. Right. So I would suggest you should start with the statin therapy as per the data. The data is wherever you place them. You have placed them high risk patients, you give them high intensity statin therapy. If these are moderate risk patients, then you can go with a moderate intensity statin therapy in that point. And just to add on, this ASCVD calculator has a very nice free app. Uh, we as physicians can use that as a very good tool. It literally takes us 20 seconds in the clinic. I have it on my phone. Most of us have smartphones these days available. And uh, sometimes I'll scribble a score uh, on the corner of my prescription. So uh, uh, this is a beautiful uh, slide that Asad is sharing from the, uh, you Google it and then it will bring it up. But ASCVD has it as a shape of a heart onto it and you can get it from App Store as well as uh, Android. I think uh, Barber has nothing much to offer in this case. It's a very high risk one. Yeah, but so I, there I is, can, I can <laughs> but just... there is a one, one question for you as well. I'll give uh, that, uh, your, take your comment as well. Okay. What about a patient with familial dyslipidemia and during pregnancy, what should be done for that? That's a very um, tricky question. I know. Just first, I'm going to put the comment on this, that this ASCVD calculator is equally important for hypertension management as well. Mm. And you go into recommendations, it also helps you decide because there's a lot of controversial studies in the last two years about aspirin. So it guides you as well for aspirin. So from cardiovascular point of view, I think it's a very good tool having an app on your phone and you can really use uh, um, your statins, blood pressure therapy, as well as aspirin recommendation by putting the data just uh, for once for your patient. Um, so about your questions in uh, familial dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia and, and pregnancy. Right. So in those cases, we know that uh, statins are contraindicated. So you really, right. So you really don't uh, have any option in that. You can use azithromycin in those cases, and lifestyle modification is what you can just try to keep them staying active, walk. I mean, you really don't want them to um, take chances with the fetal growth and abnormalities by giving them statin at that time. So um, keeping them active. Most of our time when our ladies get pregnant in our society, we tell them to rest, don't move, don't walk, don't cook we kind of restrict them uh, activities. Uh, while what we want to promote in those cases, especially in familial hypertrichosidemia or dyslipidemias is for them to be more active. In US, it is actually normal for the ladies when they're expecting not to gain weight and they are only by their obstetrician advised that they are okay to gain weight once they cross seventh or eighth month. Before that, they should be just normal weight healthy maintenance of weight requires the right diet activities. And if they're required, they can have as it in mind. Um, sometimes liver point of view, the LFTs need to be uh, um, monitored as well. 
but I don't normally give fibrates or these medications to hypertrichosidemia uh, pregnant patients. So I think it's very good to inform them before uh, planning their pregnancies if they are on statin that they should be stopping their statin prior to even planning pregnancy. So let's quickly move on to our third scenario. We are running just coming to the end of our uh, uh, webinar. That's the third one. It's looking pretty simple, but a number of times we have seen people after getting a good levels of ta uh, target levels, they either reduce the dose of statin or even sometimes stop the statin, especially general practitioner. We have seen once your LDL is like 50 or 55, which is the aim you need. They say that up to up, bilkul kamzor ho jayenge, or ye ho jayenge, wo ho jayenge. Yes, Asad. I think uh, uh, Dr. Tayyip Boyodin, Tayyip. You can start with it. Can you unmute, unmute Tayyip? Tayyip, can you unmute? Sorry. So this, this is this is a fairly straightforward. This is a young gentleman who is diabetic who has anterior wall MI. So um, in this case, you need high dose intensity statin therapy to begin with. He has high risk features. Uh, these are one of those patients that you straightforward, like an LDL of 180. These are certain criteria which are deemed as high risk. So you will commit this patient to a high intensity statin therapy from the get go. Um, uh, so, and if he cannot achieve the goal, then of course you will add the agents as we have discussed previously. Now, if his triglycerides are also high after adding a high dose intensity, uh, a high dose uh, statin therapy, then yes, he'll be a candidate or for fibrate for sure. But again, the primary goal here is LDL. You know, it's not the triglycerides. If you can't achieve LDL and you are adding fibrates, that doesn't make sense. I think azetamide would be of a much more help to him than a fibrate. Uh, getting his LDL uh, to levels less than 50, 55 would be the way to go. Yeah, and apparently here the levels are 135. So at least more than 50% even reduction would, would really bring him to his target. And for that, you may need very high dose, at least 20 to 40 Rezuvo or 40 to 80 Atova. We have seen even people starting even for the right from the beginning, a very low or moderate dosages of Atova statin or Rezuvo statin. Any comments, Asad or Kamran? Yeah. So I'm just going to take that. So the NICE guidelines are slightly different. They start with these low-dose statins. So a lot of our colleagues who have uh, training experience in UK sort of start these low-dose statins on, not on this particular kind of patient, but patients with some risk factors. Uh, they would start like these 5 milligram or 10 milligram at all statins, which are not really of much use when you are talking about somebody in whom you are looking for more than 30% reduction in their LDL level. Secondly, you just uh, you were talking about this in the scenario where the cholesterol LDL comes down to 55 and people are stopping it. And uh, totally agree, that's happening very commonly, uh, especially for, uh, because, uh, with our GP colleagues that, oh, yeah, my ji, doctor sahab ne ek mahine ke liye thi cholesterol niche aa gaya, to humne ab band kar diya. When you check their cholesterol, uh, first of all, they don't want to get it checked because they said it was checked two months ago. It was normal. I don't need to get it checked. <laughs> and then it's very hard to convince them to start a statin therapy because of all the risk factors that they have. And uh, again, I hear this day in and day out, that this LDL 55 is not going to be done. So, I said, 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 I Bottom line is that uh, we need to be aware of these guidelines and we need to spend time talking to these patients, first of all, regarding lifestyle uh, modifications and then um, imposing on them the importance of statin therapy when it's indicated. And we have already discussed that not every patient should get it. All right. The number of time we start uh, statin therapy in patients with atherosclerotic heart disease even without lipid profile. Hmm. Usually the first event and we start usually. So what's the time to get his first lipid profile done and how to then react according to our dosages? Whatever we discuss, I think that first dose should be high dose statin, not a moderate or low dose. Then afterward, 
let's see first lipid profile usually people do it after 6 weeks some people do it after 3 months the so rough target i think 6 weeks to 3 months now how one should behave if someone has started let's see a 20 mg of rosuva after the first lipid profile uh, after 6 weeks or 3 months what levels are acceptable to keep the patient on 20 mg of rosuva yes kamran or Asad, you want to no, I can I can do that. Um, it's uh, pretty straightforward from that point of view. Um, mostly, we're giving high dose statin not for the numbers. I mean, like you said, in patients coming with an MI, you give them statins high dose for their pleiotropic effect to reduce the CRP, the inflammation, and to make the plaque stabilized. So, whenever you are giving a statin dose at that high dose, my uh, personal experience and the guidelines say to continue it at least for uh, six months. And after six months, you can taper it down according to your LDL numbers. So as long as your LDL numbers are maintained, even if it is with 10 milligrams to less than 100 LDL, it's good. If it's an extremely high risk patient, there are uh, guidelines which suggest that you need to keep their LDL less than 70 and an extremely high less than 55 as well. So I think you taper your dose according to your LDL goals. Um, many a times I ask my patients to um, bring their old reports of fasting lipid profile because when we are checking them, they're already taking off and on statins and that sometimes changes their numbers to what actually the baseline is. But if you see their two years old results and you see even one or two reports with LDL more than 190, these patients are better off having life long statin therapy and don't feel bad about it. It's just gonna protect you from the future events. Okay, thank you, Bob. But I think we are almost coming to our just one minute left. So I would request both of our speaker to say a few one-liner conclusive comment, comments and then we'll end this webinar. Yes, uh, uh, Asad. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, I think uh, it should, be, it, well, starting statin therapy or considering somebody for statin therapy uh, does not comprise of just looking at the lab reports. You need to look at the patient, take a brief history, and look at what sort of risk factors the patient has. And then there should be a discussion between yourself and the patient, and probably his family members in our setting as well, that uh, why do we need to start a statin therapy? And once you start statin therapy, I think it's imperative that on their every visit, you make sure that they are still taking it. And if they are getting any side effects from it, as Dr. Tayyip mentioned, we have alternatives available then that the which should be offered promptly. That's one. Thank you, Asad. Yes, Tayyip. Anji, so I think uh, number one thing that I would add is the lifestyle is very important. Uh, although we're talking about statin and scores and whatnot, but I think we need to rehash, spend some time with the patient. And Kamran did mention it very nicely uh, about walking and everything. And number two, I think you should use, start making a habit of using this ACVD calculator. It'll make your life so easy. Once you start getting into doing it routinely, you're putting your patient at 10%, 7.5%. And then once you have those numbers in front of you, and the next time you put, hey, my goal is not, if you write it on your prescription, hey, next time I want this LDL to be 100, 90, 80, depending on the goal, I need a 30% reduction, I need a 50% reduction. I think that would all make us good clinicians following uh, the evidence-based medicine. I think, again, I thanks all the speakers, Dr. Kamran Babar, Dr. Asad Akbar Khan, Dr. Tayyip Muhyiddin, and lastly, High Noon for their support in arranging this webinar. So it's all from our side, and we'll be again with another webinar next month. Probably date will be announced soon, and I hope our team will be with us in that as well. Thanks a lot to all. Thank you very much. Thank you.